Hi, everybody. Um, I am honored to get to address all of you. This is my first super duper WordCamp experience. Uh, it's very intense. Um, I like the nerdly feeling. I'm from that world. Um, I wanted, I, I planned the talk and then I realized I had a better idea that came along. So I'm going to start a little different. So apologies for veering off a track here. But um, I was in Detroit um, maybe over, like well over a month ago. Uh, I, I was uh, visiting Detroit uh, with a new friend of mine, Hodge Fleming. So I want to show you a little video here. This is Hodge. So in the next 24 hours, we want to get one to two websites online and actually put businesses on the grid. Okay. So we're starting that. with ground zero. We have a business in a neighborhood, a business owner with a great business idea. Next thing is that we want to make it visible to people all over the world. Okay, let's try that. I want to introduce to you my friend Hodge Flemings. Hodge, come on up here. Hodge, come on up. Hodge. So I, I met Hodge through the conference that he runs in Detroit. It's sort of a TED-like conference of thought leaders that connect business and technology. And um, Haj was so kind to be my guide to visit Detroit to work with small businesses. Can I talk a little bit about Detroit? Is there any Detroit people here? Okay, there right, we go. Detroit in the house. All right. <laughs> Good. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Detroit is a, is a very interesting place. Um, it's a place where I believe it can be the blueprint for inclusion. It can be the blueprint of transformation. We're a city that has gone through a lot. Uh, there's a lot of gritty business owners that put their hard hat on every single day. And there's a lot of things that are happening in the city, but a lot of what I see is very homogenous. It's happening in downtown and midtown, but I think that we have to build a city for all people. And, and, that's, and that's what we're truly interested in in terms of helping business owners. And so we, we set off to visit your friend Alicia George. Let's, let's watch Alicia here for a second. It started because I had a dream of owning my own coffee shop in the year 2000. Uh -huh. um, I was working with Blackbusters. Uh -huh. And basically, um, after working and seeing that the group was eliminating blight and cleaning up and fixing up, it just made sense that, okay, after we clean up and fix up, don't we all supposed to come together and talk and be a community? So I was like, oh, I would love to have a coffee shop. Yeah. And so my dream was to have this. And although I had the dream and the vision, it was a group of individuals that helped. It was everybody, uh, artists, poets, musicians, um, volunteers from universities, uh, corporate America, everybody joined in to produce something that eventually became the Artist Village. So I, I remember meeting Alicia. I was so taken by her business, which wasn't this quote unquote business, dollar sign business. It was a community business. And again, I, I just invited Hodge up like five minutes ago, so this is unprepared. Um, but what, what is it that you've seen in business you've worked with in Detroit that's common like that? Um, I find that there are a lot of challenges that it's very difficult for me to be able to change by myself. Like, like there are streets that have seven lanes of traffic. So we have foot traffic issues in terms of going into the store. This particular store, they get about 290 cars that go down the street a day. There's about 14 people that walk in. They generate about $3,500 in revenue, not profit, in revenue. There's 40 to 100 customers that come in the door. She has no website. So when you begin to look at building a website or building a digital presence for a business owner, it's huge because now if you're coming from the suburbs, are you really going to drive to a neighborhood in Detroit that you've never been to that you have safety concerns or security concerns without being able to visibly see something online? And so that's what we began to really think about how we could move the needle. So now because that website validates you, it you now exist. There's a credibility that comes along with it. And it's ground zero in terms of being able to market yourself. And so, and so we realized this is something that I don't have to wait for the city to change, you know, and come up with road diets and put, you know, bike lanes in and come up with all kind of medians and all kind of cool stuff because they're trying to keep the doors open. The other point is that these business owners are working 10 to 12 hour days, meaning that they really don't have the time to try to develop and understand all the marketing pieces. They need someone who can kind of help them to get on board and then put together a system that allows them to be able to manage it. And so what we did, uh, and I, when, I, when I met Hodge and I felt his, his vision for 
Detroit and for cities across America and across the world, I think, too, uh, we set off to make a website. And um, I'm, I'm not sure, if you're like me, I make websites all the time. Click, drag, drag, meet, whatever, you know? And so I, I think I, I, I became lost in that process. Um, I knew I needed to learn, so I was able to learn from Haj and learn especially from Alicia. I want to share the moment where we showed her her website. That you, people can click it and they can see a beautiful smile. We scroll down here. We are more than just Java. Come here and get your detox water. Oh my I, God. I never seen a bottle of detox that was that big, so I said, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, they got a gallon of detox water, but it's all good. So we have to, So we are. So this is just the start, but you know, so we started. All right, so can, can, is this live? Like, can we it's use live. this for the swim? This can yeah. I give this as a link to the this site? Is a possible customer. To, yes, yes, happens? absolutely. It's live. It's online. Everybody can see it now. So thank you, Hosh. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And so the point of this experiment wasn't to help someone, it was to learn from them. And this is something I see over and over in how design is changing today. Um, it's the fact that we as experts in design uh, sort of knew everything maybe. Uh, there were a lot of books that told us how to know everything. Uh, but our challenge is how to get close to the people who actually need things. And uh, Haj has been one of the many guides in my life. Now he's my guru uh, to understand uh, what, I don't, what I don't understand about small businesses in America. So thank you, Haj. Give me one more applause for Haj again. Thank you. Thank you. That was completely impromptu, by the way. Um, so I like to sort of give you the, the answer so you can leave early if you have to use the bathroom. Uh, but I have three answers uh, if you sit through this, through this presentation with me. Um, the first is that this is a great place to be, this, this place of WordPress, this idea of democratizing publishing, being inclusive, uh, enabling everyone to participate in this digital revolution that's been around for now a few decades. Um, so we have all the values right here to, to, to make inclusion important. It's already in us. Um, and I believe that the word design and inclusion are inseparable. Uh, someone asked me, am I an HR? Uh, I love HR, by the way. Um, but I think that inclusion uh, and design are so linked together because it's about understanding people. Uh, Sonia Lay just gave a talk just a few minutes ago about how understanding your audience. Know, know your audience means are you acting inclusively? Um, but here's the problem. The problem is that the education system teaches you to not care as much about the people you're working with uh, because in education, it's too hard to access the users. So you live in an abstract world of how to create things. You live in your own bubble, essentially. Um, and that bubble extends now to the, to the technology industry as well. So design right now, uh, breaking out of that bubble is the huge challenge today. And inclusion is, lies at the core of the how to get there. Um, the word diversity is a complex word. I've been studying it for now 15 years. Um, and uh, my favorite definition is a definition that breaks diversity into two types of diversity. Uh, one type of diversity is uh, acquired diversity. The other is inherent diversity. Um, the difference is uh, quite subtle but important. Um, acquired diversity is something you can uh, learn by being with people unlike yourself. Um, it's taking yourself out of your comfort zone to learn how that person lives and feels. Uh, inherent diversity means you're actually in that group. You have experiences that only you will know what that feels like. Um, but both exist. Um, and in many senses, for those who may not have the ability to have an, 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 an inherent diversity, you can always have an acquired diversity. And with an acquired diversity, what happens is you understand the people better, and you can serve them better. They'll be your happier customers. Um, so, um, and especially in the case of technology products, because technology products are very unique in that their marginal cost equals zero, which means that it costs no money to distribute these products at scale. And because of that, uh, it produces incredible access to this service that's capable online. And with that access, it means your total addressable market, the people you're addressing, 
are much broader than you might ever expect. And so coming out of your own zone of who you know will only increase your chances of success. That's the takeaways. OK, now let's like start over then. Uh, so this is my title. Um, I made the title especially long so I can explain what I do. Um, global head. Uh, uh, automatic is global. WordPress is global. So I'm, I'm owning that. Um, the second things are computational design, a certain kind of design, and inclusion, which I talked about. Now, per people ask me why I'm so passionate about inclusion um, in the context of design. Uh, it's actually quite simple. It's because I had an accident. Who's ever had an accident before? Accident? It's very jarring. You over there with the black hair. It's, it hurts. Something happens, and it's like, wait, I thought life was like a normal thing. And then something happens. I had the fortune of an accident where I was jogging. I was in venture capital for three years, working in Silicon Valley. And uh, I was uh, living in Airbnbs. I was trying to live like a millennial. Um, and uh, living in Airbnbs in Palo Alto. And I was jogging all the time, because I jogging is good. You know, it's, this healthy thing is supposed to be really good for you. Um, I would wake up at 4.30 and go jogging. Um, and I would jog on the sidewalk, which I know isn't great, but it was accessible to me. Um, and uh, one morning I was jogging. And I was uh, running toward this light. I saw this light over there. I see it every year. You know, I'm running towards the light. OK, I want to make that light. And then what happened is I tripped. Now, I thought that the sidewalk was flat. Be careful. The sidewalk is not flat all the time. We use a linear hypothesis. Do not use that linear hypothesis. Anyways. My uh, guidance system was very confused. Like, whoa, wait a second, I'm flying into the air. Bad situation. Uh, I'm going to crash. This is really bad. Uh, and so I landed on my face and my arm. And I heard the crunch. And I was sort of lying there in my own blood, sort of sitting there with my, I, my Apple Watch, but no iPhone. Really useful. Um, and with no ID and thinking like, huh. This is a really bad situation to be in. Um, and you know, you're passing out and like, oh, yeah, this is not good. OK, so I'm, if you feel like that Mars rover that like lost computer two, one, two, and three, um, you're like, oh, not good, you know? Um, but you know, the power of the, the mind and the body. So I, I would get up and I would like lie on the sidewalk. It was 10 blocks roughly. I would, I would get up and lie on people's lawns and then kind of hobbled along and, and got to the Airbnb and got my phone. And I found out, like, you know, uh, the, the hospital was, like, you know, 20 minutes away. So I got called up an Uber. I cleaned up a bit. I was, like, a zombie looking a little bit. But it's OK. It was dark. Couldn't tell. Um, and just asked my name. Didn't look at my face. And I uh, got to the emergency room. Um, and then, of course, you know, what happens is they, they give you a clipboard. Um, and the clipboard, I'm a, I'm a right-handed person, so I, I can't fill out this, this form. Uh, well, you have to fill out the form, otherwise it can't be admitted, she said to me. And I said, oh, OK, I'll fill out this form. So like, you know, like kindergarten script, and uh, I can't read this, but I got this will go, you know. And then, so, and then I was uh, in a little room, waiting in a little room. Um, and I was there for like an hour. And you know when you're in the hospital, there's all these doctor-like people? Right? You don't know if they're really doctors or not, but you better call them doctor just in case. Um, so one of these doctor-like people came in and said to me, whoa, you look really bad. <laughs> you know? And, and he said to me, can you move your neck? So I moved my neck. And he said, man, you're lucky. And I said, yeah, totally lucky. Like, I landed the bad way, but I was still OK. Huh, really good, you know? And then a half an hour later, a nurse comes in. He says to me, um, oh, you look really bad. Uh, what, were we, what were you doing? I was jogging. Jogging. It's not going to make you healthy. Look at you, you know? And I said, yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed, you know? And he said, were you wearing a vest or anything, like a light? I said, no. He said, you could, you could have been hit by a car. And I thought, wow, I could have been hit by a car. 
And, you know, from those two moments, you know, it was like surgery came like within eight hours, et cetera. It was all kind of a blur, but I remember coming out of those two moments of feeling just so lucky. Um, and um, in that feeling of lucky, uh, I, I found this one piece of knowledge that I was working on, which was that uh, over the many years of my life, uh, I had noticed that I was curious about this question of diversity and inclusion. I, I, I led the efforts at MIT when I was president of a college. It was important to me. But it was at that moment where I discovered that I was Asian. I know, right? I was like, oh my gosh, I'm Asian. I didn't know I'm Asian. Um, and uh, actually, uh, I actually had a post where I came out as Asian. Um, but, um, <laughs> And, and the reason why is because I want to highlight that um, I recognize that by being an Asian male, uh, I've always been able to advocate on behalf of everyone, uh, whether you're a, a Caucasian male or an African American male or a female. I, I'm, all, I'm always there supporting someone who is different because I'm kind of like a type O minority. <laughs> like, I can go everywhere. Are you one? I'm not sure, but it's okay. But, you know? Um, but I discovered it as actually a secret power. So with that secret power, I began to ask the question, how can I use this? Uh, how can I be of service to uh, humankind? Um, and so I began realizing that I had spent most of my life in this area, a space called computational design. And computational design is essentially a fancy word for in the 80s, I was lucky to have been a combination of an MIT computer science person and also a visual arts person. So I was putting things together, I was writing code, I was making all kinds of graphics that most people couldn't make in the 90s. Today everyone can make everything now, but back then it was hard to make a lot of things. Uh, I made a lot of things for different clients. Uh, I wrote software to express, which at the time seemed kind of odd. Today in, in 2016 it's so normal. But back then, I was like, you know the claymation Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer thing? Or there's that island of misfit toys? I was, I was the dentist, the elf. It was really bad. But because I was early, I made all kinds of things for all kinds of companies. And so it was a good, it was a good run uh, to design at the time because it was rare to put these two skills together of computation uh, and visual art. Um, and uh, what I've been trying to do ever since is to understand what worked and what didn't. So I'm going to talk a little about design now, uh, because I think some of you are curious about design. Uh, some of you are designers. And uh, regardless of if you're curious or not, you may have heard of this typeface called Comic Sans. There's like whole, there's like whole websites about this. People make fun of it. You know, It's like a, it's a poster child of uh, something people like to like, like make fun of. You know? But I, I like Comic Sans. I have a problem with it. Um, we only have a problem with it when it's not used well. And so I want to show you an example of how that happens. So in design, there is, oh, by the way, if you have any questions for me, just uh, text to my phone, num phone number there, 650-272-0471. Um, and I can, uh, I'll be able to stop at any time and answer your question. OK, yep. The number is on stage right now. What's going on? Yes, that's my number, um, whoever you are. Um, so uh, design is composed of two things, uh, form and content, um, at least in graphic design, mind you. There's what it feels like and what it's communicating. This is like an old, old idea. Um, uh, now, I note that if we look at Comic Sans, uh, formally speaking, what is it? It's an informal handwriting style. Like, it looks like it was drawn with someone's hand. Whether you dislike that person's handwriting, it was drawn by hand. Now, if you think of, like, content, so what kind of content should I pair Comic Sans with? Then we discover how design occurs. Maybe it's appropriate for comics, right? Comic Sans, perhaps it's useful for comics. Let's check. So on the left, I have a Mouse Man calling out to Catman in Helvetica. On the right hand, I have Medicine with Comic Sans. 
Now, of course, um, you're concerned about the medicine. You're like, whoa, Comic Sans medicine. I'm not sure if I can take this stuff, you know? When Mouse Man's talking in Helvetica, you're like, oh, it's like a modernist comic. I'm OK with that. Um, but if you reverse the two, something magical happens. Suddenly, the medicine I will take. It's from Switzerland. It's going to be all right. But, and, and Mouse Man's totally OK. It's so informal. You know, the design is working. It's working because Comic Sans is used for comics. But I bring up the example because um, this Combining these two together is what designers are very good at. And I had the fortune of uh, a teacher, Paul Rand, who was a designer who designed the IBM logo and things like that. And he was adamant about it. It's just, this, it's just this method. It's a method of putting the two together. And designers tend to be unusually good at it. And by the way, the reason why I have the phone number up there is because I discovered that there's something called WordPress.tv, YouTube, Vimeo. You can always watch someone speak anytime. But um, if you want to ask me a question, I can stop, and I can, I can, I can, I can get to you. I can service your needs immediately. Um, I wish to include you in this presentation. Uh, so, um, so that's design, form, content. And I'd like to say the kind of design that's very important is design that's about utility, not just about aesthetics. Design tends to be a lot about aesthetics, especially in industry. Um, a lot of companies uh, have believed that design is the place that makes something beautiful. Like, oh my gosh, this thing is terrible. Can you make it beautiful for me? Um, and what happens nine times out of 10, designers are called into action to make it more beautiful. What does that mean? I mean, how easy is it to make something beautiful? I'm not sure there's an absolute beautifying method. Otherwise, like, we'd have figured it out. So it becomes something highly subjective. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But when design's about utility, it changes. Uh, it gets actually a lot easier uh, to understand. And let me give an example. So uh, Deborah Adler uh, designed medicine bottles for Target. These are no longer in use, I, I think. But I mean, she, she designed medicine bottles in response to the fact that her mother almost took the wrong medicine. Do you remember when medicine bottles looked like this? They had all these stickers all over them. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm totally going like, to overdose by accident. Um, some, some places still use this system. But it wasn't a very good system. But uh, Deborah brought in a different system for Target that was systematized, uh, easy to read. Um, and it was uh, a revolution in thinking about design in, in regards to utility, uh, a common utility, in this case, taking medicine, which you, as you get older, you realize you have to take more medicines, and so it gets really important. If you're younger, you don't care that much, but if you're older, trust me on that one. Um, now, I've been talking with different uh, designers, engineers, and one of my favorite uh, comments from James Nyland, he's an engineer at Automatic, uh, as I was describing design to him, he said, interesting. It is by far the most scientific perspective on design that I've come across. Um, I, I, I tend to enjoy the scientific descriptions of design because they're more uh, logical, more rational. But I am irrational enough to uh, ask for, your, for you to talk to me. Um, Comic Sans is my favorite font. Designers need to stop hating. Laugh out loud. <laughs> Someone is now asking me for Venmo payment. That's great. That's new. Very creative audience. So keep them coming. I'm, coming. I'm listening. I can hear you. Um, so uh, on the one hand, design can be about debating beauty, which is a pretty tough debate to get into. But some people love that debate. Um, I don't recommend going there, but it's fun with, a, uh, in, 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 with inebriation, et cetera. Um, but design can be about enhancing utility. That's where it gets exciting. Uh, that's where uh, a lot of great design occurs. However, the combination still matters. I don't mean to diss the pursuit of aesthetics. Um, let me explain. So when you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, it's a great general model for how people uh, evolve from just the basic need to, to eat, to, to be able to, to think, to be part of a community, to move up this thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, at the very top, Beauty is absolutely critical because it's what you get to have after you've graduated from all levels. 
it's the pinnacle of like, this is what is right. This is what is good. This is what is great. Uh, at the very lowest end, however, you just want it to work. That's all you care about. Um, and it's this combination of the two where everything works out well. Um, now, the combination is very hard to achieve. Um, the combination is hard to achieve because they are not the same. They're two different types of things. Um, but they're, type, they're parts of who we are as people. So uh, the, the nice thing about getting older is you have more feelings. At least I've had more feelings in my life. It's like, oh, I've got some feelings. I'm sort of tearing up, a little awkward. Uh, but you're finding your feelings uh, better. Um, and in that emotional place, you are able to appreciate all kinds of things you can appreciate. Um, uh, if you're just focused on getting it done, you know, you're a whole different person. But we are a combination of those two types of people, um, and that emotional and the pragmatic. And design, at its best, is able to capture both sides and integrate them. There's a word called aichaku in Japanese. Uh, it's a great word because the two Chinese characters that form it, the first one means love, and the second one means fit. So it's that combination of something that fits you, it, it provides that value, but it's also something you're, you're going to love. You have affection for it. It's something special. Um, that kind of design is very hard to create. Um, that's what makes design interesting. This is from, let's see here, one second. I like to be disrupted. I hear you on having to take more and more meds as you get older. Getting old is hard. See, right? Validated. Um, I got more emotional after the birth of my daughter. Children can break down the strongest of men. See that? Oh, man, there's feeling in here. That's why I do this. OK, so now here's the problem. The problem is that, on the one hand, this emotional value of like making something beautiful and powerful um, is generally subjective, right? Like, you might feel different. This person in the green, blue, green shirt over here, you might feel it differently um, than someone else. On the one hand, you can also say, well, this is so useful. Um, of course it's useful. It's objective. Uh, the reality, though, is that both of these uh, modes are subject to flaws. Uh, the first one is that this idea of beauty only exists because if you're a designer trained in aesthetics, you believe you know what is beautiful because you've trained to understand what you think it is. And in doing so, it seems objective to you. So if you try to argue with a designer about Comic Sans, it's dangerous. Don't try. Like, I really like Comic Sans. You know, it's like Gandalf will step in and say, don't you dare love Comic Sans. You know, so that's, it, it's irrational because it's learned. You know, it's learned to become so objective. You know? and, it, and it's hard to break those, those things as a, as a senior designer as you get older. Like, how do you break those patterns you've learned to be so comfortable in? On the other hand, something is like so useful. Like, of course it's useful to you all. It tastes the same. It's all great. You know, this is helping all of humankind. This is what we're sold as value. But there's so many products that have been designed for everyone that aren't designed for everyone. Simple example is modern medicine. Uh, modern medicine has been designed for men. Uh, it's been tested primarily on men. It's because actually and only until a few years ago are women able to be tested for these new drugs because it was not allowed for women to be able to use as test subjects for these drugs. So what does that mean? It means that we administer medicine that's good for all people, but it hasn't been tested on all types of people. So this idea of utility is also subjective, too. Now, now why do I give you this just before you're about to see state of the word, which is like going to be awesome? I don't mean to depress you at all. But it's in these two truths. They both have falsehoods in them. And the way we resolve it is through asking questions about inclusion. I know it might seem very simplistic, but it's what I think um, can help. Oh, interesting. A little slightly inappropriate thing to tell me. OK. Um, we'll censor that one. Um, so three kinds of design uh, are in play. 
the first kind is traditional design. Traditional design is the design that um, I was talking about. The design of chairs, the design of type, design of things that work really well. Um, every type of design requires understanding good engineering. I don't know a single graphic designer who doesn't know a printing press back and forth, or a single uh, designer who doesn't understand the technology that, that, that creates uh, a, a shelf, that engineering behind it. Um, and the business sensibility is also key to design. Uh, most designers believe that design has nothing to do with business. Um, have you heard of the school called the Bauhaus? Bauhaus, yeah, some of you designing people, Bauhaus. You know, the, Bauhaus was this amazing school. It was kind of like the Justice League of America. Uh, uh, it was like all the great designers came together in Germany in like late 1900s, early 1900s, 1918, 1920, 1921. And they all came together to sort of create the field of design. This was uh, a project of the German economic ministry. Uh, it was a business play actually because German was, Germany was failing at creating goods that could compete on the global level. Uh, and actually the Bauhaus was created in reaction to the British. In 1857, uh, the British, who were hugely jealous of the French, established a ministry to create two institutions, the Royal College of Art and the V&A Museum, to be able to educate the British populace on how to make better things that could get higher margins. And the French, the French have been like killing it since the 1700s uh, because they recognized that things made exceptionally well and with the perception of them being exceptionally well can command a higher margin. Why is this all important? It's because design takes time and so it actually costs money to do design well. So only companies that can make an exceptional amount of money can design well. Case in point, Apple, right? I mean, again, this iPhone 7 thing's bugging me. But uh, Apple, the great company, is able to design well because of its logistics. It's able to make those things so much cheaper than they were able to do in the, pro in, in the past and therefore have higher margins to invest in design. So that's the all of design there. It's all combined, aesthetics, engineering, uh, and business. Then there's something called design thinking. Who's heard of design thinking? Design thinking, it's everywhere. Well, design thinking was on the cover of Harvard Business Review uh, uh, roughly six months ago. So big topic, design thinking. Um, what is it? It's basically a fad in business. I hate to say it, but I, I, it's clearly a fad. Business loves fads, like you know, Six Sigma, whatever, design thinking. Um, uh, what it is, uh, it's a way to be able to uh, diverge. People who work in small companies find it hard to believe that large companies need help getting creative. Um, uh, it, it's true. Uh, it's because large companies have to execute. Execution means convergence. You are not allowed to sort of go off the, the random path. And because organizations are trained to work that way, um, they lose the ability to be creative. So design thinking is a, is a method to safely take people in large corporations on a creativity journey. Um, it's very effective, uh, I think. Um, it, it is a period in time where we care about that. Okay, non sequitur. Medicine related joke. A pharmacist gave the wrong prescription, which is a bitter pill to swallow. That's pretty good. Okay. Oh, this is a good, this is good criticism here. I think it might be slightly non-inclusive to assume that people operating on the, in the bottom of Maslow's pyramid don't have the mental space or need for aesthetic beauty. You're right. Sorry about that. Alongside design utility, thoughtful aesthetics can make all experiences and lives better, a la William Morris. Thank you, 617 number person. You're right. Uh, the best design is the perfect balance of the left and right sides of the mind. Eric code 516. I don't know what that means. Okay, that's weird considering men are more statistically likely to die earlier than women. I'm sorry, I don't know, I don't know the math on that. I just know the medicine thing. Let's get a beer, that's nice. Um, <laughs> Eric Code 612, is there any design that isn't subjective? For example, natural patterns that inspire awe or seem to be universally accepted as beautiful like flowers. I'm so glad you asked this question, Eric Code 612. Um, 
uh, everything that has to do with design or art is not living in the object or experience. It's living in you. You interpret things, and your, inter your interpretation is what's create, what creates it. And your vocabulary of knowing what's out there changes how you perceive things. And that is why inclusion is such a key thing to understand today. It is that any design we're doing cannot impact the people because we don't know how they're, how they're working or feeling. Um, and lastly, uh, what is web information UX design, this new kind of design? Um, this new kind of design is all due to the fact that computing has been messing up our lives. Let me explain how. So this is an illustration. Five minutes left. Okay. This illustration of Moore's Law. Everyone heard of Moore's Law? Moore's Law? Yeah. I've been hearing this forever, you know. Um, I want to draw a picture of Moore's Law. So uh, this is based on that famous story of the inventor of chess and how the inventor of chess was going to be paid uh, one grain of rice every square doubled every time. And the emperor said, that's a good deal. Turns out it's a really bad idea. It's like a lot of rice. Um, and the numbers doubled in the back, one, two, four, eight. Okay, there we go, we keep going. So already halfway across the chessboard, two billion times faster than a period before. So in the 1970s, a computer was a certain speed, capability. The computer we use today is now two billion times faster. Now, this is hard to fathom when you consider if you were to buy a car in the 70s and imagine it to be two billion times faster in 2016 at the same price, hard to believe, right? And this is the bigger problem. If we look forward the next 30 years, computers will get this much faster. Um, it's not just billions, trillions, or quadrillions. It's nine quintillion times faster. That's the speed that uh, your nephews, nieces, children, grandchildren will be tapping into. Uh, it's, it, is, it is truly unfathomable, and that is the world we're living in today. And that's also the reason why it's exciting to be here, because we're in it right now. And we as individuals and as a community have the opportunity to actually make something with it. Five minutes. So, I have, I, and someone asked me, will I put the slides online? Yes, I will. Um, okay, I want to finish, there we go. Ah, okay, here we go. So, what is diversity versus inclusion? Uh, I raised that point about how there's inherent diversity and acquired diversity, um, which is pretty easy to understand. I hope you use the definition. Uh, inherent meaning you're, you're in that group. Acquired means you could learn that group. Um, the other thing is the words diversity and inclusion, what's the difference? This is a quote by Bernie Myers. Uh, diversity is being invited to the party. Uh, inclusion is being asked to dance. And for those who have the ability to invite people into the dance or to the party, um, that's a unique power um, that all of us have in these rooms today. So I invite you to use this. Um, so people ask me, why do I have to care about this stuff? I didn't have to before, because I would design for how I work, and it, was, it worked all the time. Uh, it worked all the time because the, the number of users in the world were, was really small, and they were technical like ourselves. Um, the users today are so different than ourselves, and so the old principles of design for the computer no longer apply. Um, they will apply if you're living just in the technology world, the pure technology world which, as you know, um, is still not as, is, is still small. It's the bigger world we're all curious about, the world of all the consumers. And so inclusion is key. Um, what does it take to be inclusive in design and tech? Um, it just takes four things. I made it easy. Um, the first is for acquired diversity. Uh, j just get uncomfortable. Like, I have like an Android phone now. So I mean, every uncomfortable thing I can do, I'm doing. It's terrible. Um, uh, again, just, just from a mechanical perspective. The second thing is to talk to people that you might not normally talk with. I love things like Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, because you meet people you might not normally meet. Uh, in terms of in inherent diversity, being able to find more people that are unlike yourself, bring them into your communities of work, 
uh, can make all the difference. Um, it's because you'll begin to see the world differently. But again, I want to make it very clear. It isn't about doing good or doing right. It's about the fact that this is how business has to work in the future. It's how you'll get the largest, total, largest addressable market by working with more people that are different than yourself. And that's what I think we're trying to achieve as we democratize publishing, to include more people. So I'm on time, and I want to see State of the Word. And I have questions. I will text you back, and I can't do the beer thing. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much.